Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's Car Clinic book launch. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Becky, and tonight we are launching In the Quaker Hotel by Helen Tiki. Um, it's her third Car Clinic collection. Really, really brilliant. We were all just admiring the cover. Um, isn't it gorgeous? Um, so tonight we're joined by Helen, and we're also joined by Sean Hewitt who you will know is an award-winning writer, poet, and critic. Um, his debut collection, Tongues of Fire, was published by Jonathan Cape in 2020 to great critical acclaim, um, and just recently announced his memoir, All Down Darkness Wide, is forthcoming from Jonathan Cape in 2022. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Sean in just a few minutes, who will introduce Helen um, and get the evening going, but there's just a few housekeeping things to go over first. Um, so we're gonna be together for about an hour tonight, um, and unfortunately, we can't see you because this is a Zoom webinar. Um, but there is a chat box, which some of you have found already. That's brilliant. So please do say hello. Um, let us know where you're watching from, how you're doing. Um, and do please make sure that it's set to everybody so everybody can see your messages. Otherwise, it's just me reading them. Um, while Helen is reading, we're going to be sharing the text on screen for you to look at. Um, and you are in control of that. So if you need it to be bigger or smaller or Helen to be bigger so you can lip read, then please play around with that. Um, and if you can't work it out, then put it in the chat and I'll try and help you. Um, later on in the event, there's going to be a chance for you to ask some questions. Um, and there's also a Q&A box, so please try and find that. Um, and any questions you put in there, Sean can put to Helen. Um, Last thing I think is thank you for paying your two pounds to be here tonight and um, we really appreciate it. And I put the discount code in the chat. I can put it in again later on in the, after, in the evening um, and it will be sent to you as an email as well. So you'll get that in some form. Okay, I think that's everything for me. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Sean now, who's gonna get the evening going. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. It's very good to be here. Um, I have been reading Helen Tukey's poems uh, for as long as I've been writing my own poems, really. I first met her in Liverpool when we were both teaching together, and it was as much an education for me as it was for the students. Um, I remember really vividly taking a seminar with, with Helen and uh, Helen, you read out uh, a poem from uh, Missile Child, uh, Helen's brilliant first collection um, called Hollow Meadows. And it's this really haunting excavation of history. Uh, it uses kind of blog um, or chat room posts and, and bits of personal memory and uh, bits of guidebooks to unearth um, this really brimmingly frightening um, idea of, of what lurks inside a place and inside history. And it stuck with me for, for weeks after I heard it because it seemed to unlock formally uh, something that I didn't really know a poem could do. And over the years, Helen's work has done that for me repeatedly. Um, her voice, I think, is really captivating. It's often eerie. It shifts perspectives. It moves from the objective to the subjective. And all her poems, I think, brim with a sense of something just beneath the surface uh, that troubles the world uh, and troubles the way we might see the world. This, I think, is no more present than in her brilliant latest collection in the Quaker Hotel, where the poems give us access to something infinite and disturbing. They are sunlit uh, in, in some ways. They travel across Europe and, and over to Nova Scotia too, but they seem to me to have a quite prophetic quality. In fact, I was reading Helen's blog post on the Carcanet blog, which I'd really encourage you to read uh, about in the Quaker Hotel. And I was interested to read that Helen wrote, um, it was one of those rare occasions when you feel as though you're just taking dictation, writing something that has come to you fully formed from somewhere else. That was about one of the poems in, in the Quaker Hotel. But without being too mystical about it, uh, I think these poems do lock into cultural anxieties and, and give voice to them. They channel the global and the ecological into really distilled uh, forms. 
they are delicate and eerie and anxious and prophetic. And in that way, they provide, I think, a really haunting record of our present time. Um, I'd like to invite Helen to read now. I can't wait to hear her. Um, Helen will be reading, I think, for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, if questions pop into your mind, as Becky said, just pop them in the Q&A chat um, at any point, because uh, I'll stay there and I'll try do my best to, to put them to Helen at the end. So um, rather than forget them uh, during Helen's reading, uh, just pop them in and I will do my best uh, to uh, put them to Helen. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, to celebrate the launch of In the Quaker Hotel, Helen Tukey. Oh, thanks so much, Sean. Um, ooh, my video started and then it disappeared. Hang on. Right, there we are. <laughs> can you see me and can you hear me? That's, that's the main thing. Um, I hope so. Um, good, yes, excellent. Um, thank you so much, um, Becky, and thank you so much, Sean. Um, it's it's really, really great to be here, and um, I'm, I really want to thank everybody who's here um, and everybody who's kind of helped me um, in the process of, um, of putting this book together. Um, you all know who you are, um, and I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Um, it's, it's never something that can kind of happen just by itself with one person. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start by just saying a few things really about how the book got started um, and how it sort of developed from that starting point. Um, and then what I'm going to do is read a, a group of poems from the first section of the book, and then I'll sort of move, um, kind of move, move through the book um, as, as we go. Um, so yeah, Sean mentioned the blog post uh, that I'd written for Carcanet, which some of you might, might have read. Um, as I explained in that, this book had a really, what felt like a really specific starting point. Um, it started with my reading a newspaper report um, just on my phone, you know, kind of over breakfast um, at, at some point early in 2019. And it was about the proportion of insect species that had died out uh, since about 1970. So for me, that was kind of more or less since my lifetime. And it, it just struck me so shockingly that was such a short amount of time in, in terms of the whole uh, history of the world. And we we managed to kind of make half the insect species extinct in that time. Um, and kind of straight away, really, and this is what Sean's referring to, I had that unusual experience where a poem just started sort of forming itself, just started sort of speaking itself in my mind. And that was what became the poem Amber. Um, it started in the kind of present, this, this sort of present moment of just not knowing how to respond to this news. And it unfolded back into a childhood memory, a memory of being on the beach, um, a kind of holiday memory. And that, that sort of structure of our present moment as something that somehow is facing both ways, that's kind of haunted by the future, uh, the kind of losses that are sort of coming our way, if you like, and also kind of tilting us back to the past, making us kind of see the past um, through new eyes, I suppose. That facing both ways structure was something that really came to be um, central to the whole book, really. And lots of the poems kind of play that out in different ways. Um, it also brought up a sort of set of images around that idea of fleetingness. Uh, and because it was a holiday memory, it sort of brought up memories of being in guest houses, um, of being in hotels, that sense of being a kind of temporary visitor somewhere. And that to me seemed to connect with this whole idea of the fleetingness of our stay here on earth, you know, the fact or the idea of us as temporary guests really in our own lives and also on the planet, I suppose. So again, that kind of started to play out in a lot of the poems in, in different ways, um, and hence, hence the kind of title, um, the, the title poem is one of those. So there's a set of images that are sort of recurring and revolving and sort of echoing throughout the book in slightly different ways. And I hope that you'll be able to uh, sort of hear that and, and, and kind of see that um, through the reading. Okay, so I am going to read, um, I'm going to start, as I said, with reading um, a sort of group of poems from, from the first section of the book. Um, 
and I'm going to start with the first poem, which is called Under the Lightship. The lightship rides at the top of the cliff, just beyond the promenade. No one remembers when it came, nor can they read the white name painted backwards on its hull. The town lives below the ship, submerged in the blue of early dusk or the hour before sunup, rattle of laughter and breaking glass rising in the narrow air between the tall white guest houses. No vacancies, monochrome buzz of small TVs on kitchen tables. Someone has cut a hole in the town, a picture window onto a beach, very early, pale gold streaks on the water and black rocks, or maybe islands. The scale is tricky, somewhere surely far to the north. The people are sleeping a long time ago, but dawn is coming up like fire under the lightship, pouring through the cracks in the town. Too fast, too soon, too bright to be born. Okay, so the second poem um, is a poem I just mentioned and it's called Amber. When they told us the insects were dying, we finally understood it was over. We didn't know how to tell the children, went out for a walk by the long edge of the playing fields. The sky was yellow. Sundays had always tasted of sorrow, but this was different. We remembered the beach by the glass green water, how Sarah had found a huge chunk of amber, lugged it up to the hut on the prom to show Theo the lifeguard, the rest of us crowding, trying to prove we were part of the finding. And every day for the rest of the summer, we scoured the tide line for yellow pebbles, desperately wanting them to be amber. And when summer was over, we put the beach in our pockets and went back to school. Okay, this is the title poem, In the Quaker Hotel. Single room on the top floor, narrow bed, plain white bedspread. Ventilator hum like a ship's distant engines, floorboard creak. The brochure suggests a retreat for inquirers. Could I learn to experiment with light? Can be challenging the writer warns, but may lead to new growth. Below the window, communal gardens, flagged square with two beehives, a kind of altar, it comes to me, bees the tiny gods we depend on, each of us at our glowing window, a very practical discipline. Okay, and I'm gonna read the last poem in this first section, uh, which is called New Brighton, August. There's two poems in this book uh, set at New Brighton, um, and it also harks back to the very first poem in Missile Child, uh, which, which was also set at New Brighton. Um, it's a particularly fascinating place to me. It's the end of the uh, Mersey estuary where the river comes out um, into the Irish Sea. And um, I'm sure many of you know it, just really seems to encapsulate this sense of past, of present, of future, of things not being quite one thing, or the other thing, or being both at the same time. So this is New Brighton, August. This place again, odd angle, where land meets water, river turns sea. Tide going out fast, riffling backwards over ridged brown sand. Straight ahead, wind turbines pecking at the water like tall white wading birds. Guarding the river, the shut fort, built for an invasion that never happened. Sandstone hull sunk in the sand, superstructure twisted, tilting, radar antennae still turning, still listening, though to what signals and who could be there to receive, decipher. Fifty yards further out, the lighthouse, still elegant, white paint, only a little rust stained, low down where the iron ladder clings to the side, climbs up to the recessed doorway's dark slot. 30 lamps, three fog bells, stripped out years ago, 
Now pigeons nest in the roof beams, dive and flutter the lantern room as though trying to catch our attention. Look at what's no longer here. Are you sure you won't be glad of them, those lamps and bells, when your satellites have all blinked out, when your radio's full of empty air? Okay, so the second section in the book um, is called Hospitality of Water. Um, and it's set, mostly set in southern France. Um, I was lucky enough to make a few trips to southern France. Um, and I found myself in this very, very unfamiliar situation of sort of very hot, um, very hot, very bright, very kind of um, dry sort of heat. Um, and so it's, it's, it's dealing with that really. And again, that, that feels like a, a tremendously double-edged thing, obviously, um, that, that sense of heat and light and brightness. Um, as indeed, I think, is the word hospitality um, and, and the word hospital that it contains. You know, it's, it's got uh, senses of, of kind of shelter, of, of, of someone taking you in. It also has um, senses, obviously, of sort, sort of sickness and illness and, and, and a place that you don't necessarily want to be. Um, a, a group of the poems in this section are inspired by um, paintings and drawings by Van Gogh, and particularly the ones that he made when he was in the south of France, when he was staying at the asylum in Saint Remy. Um, so again, a very um, two two sided sort of sort of double edged relationship to a landscape. Um, so I'm going to read two of those poems. Um, the first one, uh, Long Grass with Butterflies. This was partly inspired by an experience of um, trying to look at this painting, uh, it's a painting by Van Gogh, trying to look at it in the National Gallery and being almost unable to see the painting because of people holding up their phones to take pictures of it. Um, so this is Long Grass with Butterflies. They encourage me to walk in the gardens but they won't allow me to stop and look. They crowd me. They hold up constantly their small devices. The grass grows tall and unkempt, granted, it seems, a certain freedom. Their devices tell them how to see. They don't allow me to see with my eyes the nakedness. They find it obscene. In the long grass are butterflies, huge and violent. The trees are cut off close to the ground. The white path leads into the trees and disappears. And the next poem I'll read is called Cyprus and this um, is responding to a uh, starry night and particularly to, to Van Gogh's um, fascination with trying to capture what he saw in the, the, the strangeness of the cypress trees, the blackness and the way they towered in the, in the flat landscape. Cyprus. It's a black flame, a fire tree that gives no light, that burns in a cold agony all night on the hill. Tall, thin, winding tower, piercing the sky, mocking the calm blue-grey spire of the church below. Some kind of a horrible miracle, this black flame that won't burn out, that writhes in the cold space of itself like the constant anxious washing of hands. Why did you show me? Why did you bring me here to this place? Now the cypress burns in my mind too, and the stars spin like Catherine wheels, vast and white and pitiless, and none of it seen, none of it dreamed, down in the valley by the small blue town, sleeping. Okay, so child figures are important in this book in, in, in a whole lot of ways. I've, I've already said a little bit about that. Um, the, the, a lot of the poems kind of look back to my, my own childhood memories. So, so the children are sometimes me and, um, you know, my, my siblings, friends from childhood, figures from childhood. Um, but they're also often kind of children, uh, people who are children now, because children again have that sort of past future dynamic. It's the children who are, who are the, the ones who are always moving towards the future, who are going to be dealing with the future. Um, and I'm going to read this poem because um, I liked the way that this child, this is based on a real incident that I saw um, in Edinburgh outside a cafe. Um, 
and I just had a sense that this child is a sort of a kind of energy, a sort of movement, um, and something that kind of both holds holds itself in childhood and, and kind of moves towards the future. Um, so I wanted to put this poem sort of almost in the middle of the book as a sort of something a bit like a punctuation mark, kind of, kind of little explosion of, um, of energy, I think, and sort of forward motion. Um, so this poem is called Leapfrog. Well, if you're going, I'm going. The small girl with dark hair exclaims to her friend on the lawn outside the cafe. I mean, you can't play leapfrog on your own. She's the one who's been making the rules, orchestrating and shaping the game, the other girls just playing along. Her friend shrugs, runs inside. She wants to know what the adults are doing. She wants to sit at the table with them, practice becoming part of their world. Left alone, the smaller girl kicks a little at the grass and follows slowly. I really like the game leapfrog, she states decisively to no one. Minutes later, she bursts back out through the French windows, begins turning cartwheels the length of the lawn. Um, so there are a number of different landscapes in this, this book. Um, we can talk a bit about this perhaps in the discussion, but one of the things that felt really important to me in, in putting the book together was a sense of people exploring landscapes and people either on their own or sort of groups of people kind of moving out through landscapes. Um, some of the landscapes are kind of very near to where I live. Um, so the, there's a sequence called Sudley Field, which um, is a field for the five minutes walk from my house in Liverpool. And that's entirely set there. Others of the poems are set in um, around Merseyside, um, North Wales, some of them a little bit further afield. Um, so we've, we've already talked a bit about the south of France. Um, and the furthest afield um, that th this book goes is, um, is Nova Scotia. Um, I was amazingly lucky in 2019, um, I, I was awarded a two week residency at Elizabeth Bishop's uh, childhood house in Great Village in Nova Scotia. This was the house where she lived with her, her maternal grandparents and her mother until her mother had, had the breakdown. Bishop writes about this house in many of her poems um, and in her um, beautiful prose piece in the village. Um, and it was just an incredible experience. I was there with a, um, a friend of mine who's a sound artist um, and, a, and a musician called Martin, Martin Heslop. And the two of us were there for two weeks um, to just respond uh, to the place and, and, and make something from it, which was, which was just a, a sort of amazing experience. And again, it seemed like a place that was extremely um, kind of haunted in some ways by, by the past, sort of ghosted by the past, if you like. The presence of the past felt, felt really strong, not just in terms of Bishop, her childhood, her family, but also just the past of all the people who'd lived who settled in Nova Scotia. And it's got a really complex layered history of settlement. It's got a lot of industrial history, none of which is there anymore. So mining, logging, shipbuilding, um, in some ways a lot like parts of the North of England. And all of that isn't there anymore. It's just traces. Um, so that sort of fed into the poems um, very much really. And again, it was um, this sense of sort of walking out across, across an unfamiliar landscape. The poems kind of that I wrote uh, sort of form a sequence. They start in the house and then they move slightly further outwards. So we move out to the kind of Bay of Fundy, um, which is the bay near, near Great Village. And then they move further uh, to Cape Breton, which is the sort of topmost part of Nova Scotia, um, the kind of northeast point, really. So I'm going to read three of the poems from this section. Um, the first one is the one that I wrote responding to the house itself. The, the second one responds to the bay, the Bay of Fundy. Um, and then the third one is set at a place called Glace Bay, which is, which is right up at the top. Um, of, of Cape Breton and so what seemed to me to be the kind of end, the end of the land, the end of the continent. Um, so this is the, 
first of the three poems. This is the one that's set um, in the house itself. 8740 Highway 2, Great Village. The house was a puzzle. It seemed so simple. A small wooden box with a shiny roof, but nothing stayed in the same place. Nothing was ever the same twice. Everywhere, windows and mirrors, reflections of windows in picture glass. Even the roof, a kind of mirror, its tin shingles reflecting the weather, bright as a knife in the afternoon sun, but in the half light of dawn, like dirty snow lying thin on winter earth. Identical windows on all four sides, each looking out on a different road, the road to Truro, to Londonderry, the road past the church, the Bay Road. The directions seeming to switch about as though the house had turned in the night and pointed now to a different matter, barometer, fortune teller, like the tiny wooden weather house my grandmother kept on the windowsill with its tiny people taking turns to come out to consider the temperature, sit on their porch and predict the future. So this next poem is called Economy Point. We took the path through the trees to the wide red bay. Soft mud sucked at our boots and the salt marsh muttered, air bubbles pocking up between thin green stems. The shoreline was strewn with the bones of trees dragged out from the soft earth, bleached and dried and flung back up in tangled heaps common graves. At the headland, the tide carved ledges of rock were easier walking. You went on ahead, fast, determined, and all the while turning your head as though listening for something. The sandstone was scoured by swallow holes, small wells of red water. I stopped to clean the weight from my boots clay slip under my nails, myself as a child moulding earth into little bowls, setting them to dry in the sun, though they never dried enough to hold water. The sound of the tide louder now, brightness sliding over the mud where we had walked, you lost to sight and only the bay looking back at me, a small creature caught and held in its wide-angled stare, speck in the eye of this ancient place of clay and water, scrabbling back over glittering rock to higher ground. Okay, so the final section of the book is called Uncharted. Um, and that came partly out of, um, out of the lockdown, um, one of the lockdowns, and watching my daughter play a video game uh, repeatedly called Uncharted. Um, I just became fascinated by watching her play this game um, and, and sort of trying to navigate through this uh, through this landscape as this as this character in the game kind of over and over. Um, but of course, also, it just seemed to fit so well with the whole idea that, you know, we we just are in um, uncharted territory in in so many ways. So I suppose um, the last section of the book in many ways kind of takes us back to the first section in, ter in terms of this sense of well this is where we are now um where are we now how do we how do we navigate that um again it draws on places real places um places that i know but it it tries to give them this slightly tilted out feeling so sort of tilted out into the future um, it's not really clear whether there's anybody there anymore, perhaps, except for the speaker or, or what's entirely happened. Um, so I'm going to read the last two poems from the book. Um, oh, I've not read Glace Bay. Gosh, sorry. I forgot. Um, OK, I'll read this one and then I'll talk about the final section of the book. Sorry. This is the final poem from the Nova Scotia um, sequence, and this is the one that's set right at the top of Nova Scotia. So it's sort of the end, the end of the land, as I said before. Um, and again, I think this is this is very much about a sense of not quite knowing what the past of this place was and wondering how that might relate to kind of where we are now. 
So this is Glace Bay. End of the continent. Nothing left ahead but sea. Past the mining museum, down on the shore, I found something I couldn't name. Made of metal, about the fit and weight in the hand of a pocket knife. Burnished and pocked as though hallmarked, split open along one side like a razor shell and jammed with jewels, tiny blocks of yellowish stone like citrine quartz or rock sugar. No way to know what it might have been, but now a gift, a souvenir, perfect and puzzling, a mind to keep. Okay, so now I will move on to read poems from the final section of the book, um, which, as I said, is, is about this idea of really uncharted territory. Um, I'm going to read the last two uh, poems from the book. The, the first one is, is a prose poem. Um, it's set at Paris Mountain on Anglesey, which some of you will know, I'm sure. It's an absolutely extraordinary landscape. Um, it's, it's a former open castle copper mine and it looks like a landscape from from Mars or something there's just these heaps and heaps everywhere of sort of um, broken pieces of rock but in, with all these incredible colours because of the minerals in the rock so it's a very very strange um, and, and quite haunting landscape um, in itself really um, so I'm going to read this one and then I'll read the final poem in the book um, which is which is called Return um, and just before I read them, I just really, again, want to thank everybody who's, who's kind of helped me, who's had a hand um, in this book, who's discussed the poems with me, who, um, who's read drafts and in some cases read many drafts um, and, and given me feedback and just given me encouragement. And um, I obviously want to thank everyone at Carcanet as well, who, um, who kind of put, put this book together for me um, and been so supportive um, and everyone here for coming this evening, thank you. Um, so this is Nightfall, Paris Mountain. Nightfall is beautiful here. Every evening I leave the hut and walk up one of the tracks around the edge of the open cast, heading for the stump of the old windmill on the ridge. Sometimes I take the seaward path, sometimes the landward. It doesn't matter, they meet at the old mill anyway. As the sun goes down over the sea, the low light makes the stone glow, the heaps of it, the broken pieces of the heart of the mountain. They glow like precious stones, orange and yellow, turquoise and green, the oxide colours seeming to draw down the last slants of sunlight and come into new life, stone flowers that bloom at sunset, as though this spoil heap were a new kind of garden. On the ridge, Leaning against the warm stone of the old mill, I look out towards the other island, the low grey mound of it. Holy Island, they called it, a bleak place of schist and scree and thin turf. I went there once to see the birds on the far side, the seaward side. Lay on my belly on the edge of the cliff and watched for a long while. The whole cliff covered with the white of them and the air full of their scream and squabble, a constant crazy coming and going a madhouse of birds. I was happy to come away in the end, back to the quiet of this used up place, my mountain. As the sun drops into the sea and the light fails, I stand looking out across towards the island, trying to make out the long line of the harbour wall, where the green lights of the marker boys used to blink, and behind them the brighter lights of the docks, the town at night a shining thing across the water. Four times a day, the big white ships would head out. You could set your watch by them. The waves they made across the bay would fetch all the kids down to the beaches. They knew the times and they'd be ready, riding the long roll of the waves that came for just those few minutes. Then the water would settle back again and the kids would disappear. I don't know how long I stand there for, but I notice it's dark now. The bats are out, flitting and diving above my head in and out of the broken mill, down to the open cast, to the edge of the water, making circuits like tiny airborne racing drivers and darting back in through the gaps in the walls. Sometimes I think I can hear them too, chittering away in their high voices, like children, 
the way the children would call to each other when we climbed the hill in the evenings, how they'd always be discovering things in the long grass, a caterpillar, a beetle, maybe the bones of some creature. And they'd call to us, come and see, come and see. And the whole mountain was alive and singing with discovery. And I turn and the broken pieces of stone slide under my heel, the colours quite gone in the dark now. And I start to walk back down the path, back to the hut and the single light I've left burning. And this is the last poem in the book uh, and it's called Return. We take down the storm shutters, pale sea light floods the rooms, wooden floorboards, the rooms quite bare, we walk through them, try the switches, generator somewhere back in the dunes. We make coffee, we walk through the rooms, boards creak under our feet, hollow drums sound of the crawl space, hiss and scritch against the porch, whisper of sand, its constant fetch against the shingles. Spring and creak of the kitchen floor as we unpack the food, stock up the cupboards, rattle of glasses on the dresser, sudden burst of radio voices, kids' voices, some station along the coast, maybe hundreds of miles, maybe not far. Signal fading in and out, wind rising, green flare of the lamps as we light them, snatch of radio harmony, surf city, here we come. And under it all, the sea murmur, unbroken thought of this place. Out beyond the mudflats, sea observes, weighs things up, begins to think of coming home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. That was brilliant. Um, it was really nice to get a whole span of the, of the book itself. Um, if anyone would like to add questions into the Q&A, uh, do so. Um, but if not, I will monopolize Helen's time and get to ask uh, <laughs> fun questions. So um, put them in the chat. You can either put them in the chat, I'll keep an eye on them, or in the box that says Q&A. Um, but either way, I'll try my best to keep an eye on both. Um, Helen, uh, because you did such a, a span of the book there, um, I wonder if you could start by talking about the span and the architecture of it. Um, it struck me, um, you know, we begin under the light ship. Uh, there's a sense of, of brightness, um, something too bright to be born. Uh, and then we end with nightfall, with the sea uh, returning, coming home. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you arranged the poems. I, I know you, you did say at the start um, there are kind of repeating images and phrases. Mm. So I wondered if it was uh, narratively or, or if you had some pattern of images or a kind of musical vision of it almost. Uh, you know, how, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really would love to say, yes, it's composed like a symphony. Um, I'm not enough of a, a musician at all to to be able to say that, but I do really like the idea of having kind of movements, in, you know, as I understand it in the way that you do have in a symphony where you've got movements of sort of different tempos, different tones, that kind of thing. So I'm a big fan of sections in poetry books, um, you know, mine and other people's, um, because I, I really like the way that it can help create that kind of, uh, that kind of structure. And you can have sections that um, have, have a slightly different mood or have a slightly different tone or that occupy a different space or different kind of landscape. So, so I guess in the case of this book, it's quite a lot about different landscapes, really. I, I think in my head, the first section is sort of um, kind of trying to give a sense of the sort of territory, if you like, the, the, the sort of where are we, here, here we are now, um, to sort of set things up a little bit. Um, and then it kind of moves out through different sections. So as I said, the second section has this very, um, has a focus on kind of Southern France and heat and light and the sort of intensity of that and, and sort of water in a very, um, the last book had a lot of black water in it and this book's got a lot of bright water in it. Um, and then it kind of moves through different different sections. So there's a section which is the sequence of Club and Field, which which um, sort, sort of sits by itself. Um, 
there's a section which is in a way the kind of weird childhood section which seems to be compulsory for me but there was one in the last book as well there always seems to be a slightly weird childhood section and then there's the Nova Scotia section and then the last section like I said is this idea of you've almost come back to the beginning but but you haven't because you've sort of been to other places mm -hmm. if you see what I mean so um hopefully the the kind of images do echo across you know um and and the, the the point you picked up on about starting with this sort of idea of dawn and, and sort of sunrise, which you would usually expect to be very positive, but it's actually a little bit, uh, there's, there's a sort of slight sense of danger with that here. And then ending, as you say, with this sort of nightfall image, which in a way is quite peaceful. Um, I mean, that was kind of fortuitous, but of course, once you see it, you think, oh, yes, perfect. Well, mm -hmm. definitely that. Mm -hmm. and then Perhaps work with it so yeah definitely I'm, I'm I'm really tried I think to to kind of make it make it move through sections in that in that kind of way yeah it's nice because I mean um I love the the way it travels around um and this idea of beginning at dawn and ending at nightfall even if there's many different times in the middle mm -hmm. um it struck me that one thing that comes up repeatedly in, in the poems is is a sense of well even in the way that you introduce it you know this realization that um kind of epochal time and helen time mm. matched up which is a really disturbing um realization um and there is a sense i can't remember the exact line now but in um even in uh under the light ship, there's there's something like that they're sleeping a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so the, these poems kind of do speak to the moment. You know, they're they're, they're mm. full of of contemporary concerns, but they also braid in a a, a sense of almost dreamlike or, or disturbing past uh, that becomes future. You know, it's hard to tell. Is this voice that you're speaking from because often it its mode is to describe or to try mm -hmm. to describe mm -hmm. uh it almost feels like being looked at from outside um yeah. you know in the way that we might kind of register the end of a civilization by describing what had happened um this is a very roundabout way of asking um how was time and these kind of different uh Mm. modes of time or, or mm. section uh, you know uh, tenses um important to you when you're writing you know that was that or was that something that emerged to you and then seemed yeah it absolutely did and it and it and it seemed to come kind of right at the beginning like i said with the with the sort of very first poems the way that there was this sense of the now you know we don't know how to tell the children that the world is ending kind of thing which is you know, a bit of a reductive way to put it but then that immediately, how that immediately kind of sent me back into a memory, a sort of childhood memory of this of this girl finding this amber, which, which I didn't at the time quite see why it was doing that. But then, um, you know, a helpful friend um, explained it to me or, or pointed it out to me, of course, you know, the way that amber holds things from the past. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that sense of the way it seems to me that the way that you know a, a present moment we're always experiencing a present moment with everything we remember you know is is part of that isn't it um i mean this is sounding a, a little bit t.s Eliot in some ways you know we're always kind of dragging with us of course all that all that sort of remembered past and all those memories um so yeah the people are sleeping a long time ago it, it kind of makes sense in your head doesn't it you you remember it's as though it's happening now but it's also happening a long time ago but the sense of the pressure of the future the way that we it, it that i think that's what really struck me that we cannot experience the present anymore without this sense of the pressure the pressure coming from the future or the not enough future and and that sort of compression into the into the present moment was exactly what I was sort of trying trying to do with the poems and, and I suppose a lot of them do have this mode where 
uh, yeah, they maybe start off trying to describe a kind of now, and then they they, they sort of perhaps reel back to 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 you know to a memory, or they kind of pitch it forward. In in terms of the sort of pitching forward, the the slightly near future thing, I do really want to. Um, kind of flag up um, Carola's, uh, Carola Luther's sequence, Letters to Rassol, which I mentioned in the blog post. And um, it, it was uh, it was in PN Review as a standalone sequence, and it's in her book that came out uh, last year. And that I found extraordinarily powerful and effective in the way that it also kind of puts you in a landscape in a now, but it's feels pitched slightly into the future. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was really inspirational for me, actually. Yeah, there's a sense of... Um... Of, of temporal pressure on, mm. on the present from, from both the, the future and the past. And it, it kind of struck me that, um, you know, when we try and talk about climate change or, or these big things like species collapse, it, we often can't really, in our mind, hold the whole thing together. Um, mm. And perhaps time is a good way, uh, a good metonym mm. you know almost <laughs> a, 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 I, I, I think that's the word I mean um, immediate anxiety here <laughs> like, like a, um, the sense of time changing or, or, or there being pressure on it yeah um, and, um, yeah. um Pauline yeah, yeah. Rowe hello Pauline um is asking a question which actually kind of dovetails with, with one that I wanted to ask too so I'll ask uh, Pauline's and then maybe just elaborate a little mm. bit um but Pauline is asking what is it about the nightfall uh, landscape that takes you into the prose poem yeah. and um it was one thing I wanted to ask too because anyone watching this and reading the book will see a really wide variety of forms and some of them are uh, almost diaristic or you know mm-hmm. uh, prose, yeah. prose like and then some of them uh, are in stanza forms and some of them like the last one use spaces in between the words yeah. um so I wondered well yeah to 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 use Pauline's question what is it that takes you to to those forms and um, yeah maybe, maybe particularly the prose form but also mm. uh, the other ones it's a really good question. In fact, thank you, Pauline. And it's it's so hard to answer as well because um, I I kind of think that it, it often feels a bit mysterious, doesn't it? Like how a poem starts shaping itself in your head, how you hear it, um, and often you have a very clear sense from the outset actually of how you're hearing it so whether you're hearing it as a voice that's kind of speaking in sentences to you that's kind of narrating something or whether you're hearing it as something much more kind of fragmentary um, and almost like sort, sort of little sparky mm-hmm. bits going all over the place um, I, I really love prose poems for the way that they well the way that they are obviously they allow you to unfold a narrative um but also lineated poems using kind of syntax allow you to do that as well um I, I think there's something there's always something a bit eerie and strange to me about prose poems and I think Ian Seed is here who's also an absolute master of the kind of eerie strange prose poem and um the way that they look as though they're just going to tell you a little story and and yet they can be quite unsettling because they're actually not quite doing that you know they they still have those elements of sort of um you know the ways that poems work so through 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 sort of associative jumps or sort of juxtaposition or kind of sound patterns or whatever so I, I often think they almost sort of trick you slightly into thinking you're going to get something much more straightforward than you are although possibly with the nightfall poem it's that is almost verging on a kind of piece of I wouldn't call it flash fiction but it's 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 almost perhaps verging out of being a prose poem and into into just a sort of piece of narrative prose whereas say there's another Van Gogh poem in here called Corridor which is just a little paragraph and is definitely a kind of prose poem and uses that sense of Oh, I'm telling you a little story, but it's really weird, um, which I think prose poems do really well. Uh, the, 
yeah, I really wanted, I've got some poems in this book that just kind of float on the page, it's sort of very little ones um, that don't use punctuation, that, you know, that use spaces, that don't use capitalization, that aren't written in complete sentences. Um, and I do think they have a very, very different effect, you know, don't they, when you, when you, when you read, not just mine, I mean, anyone's. And, and I really wanted those to act again almost like punctuation to just sort of act like a kind of little free floating like a tiny little moment I think I think the ones where I'm just trying to describe a moment are often the ones where I'm sort of knocking out the syntax and I'm just using phrases and spaces and and you sort of build it up or you hope you build it up you sort of hope you build up a picture through those whereas the ones where it's much more I'm now unfolding a narrative or, or perhaps I'm putting things into some kind of logical relation. You know, that that kind of works better with 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 lineation, with syntax, with capitals, with punctuation. But the question of why they come in one way or the other in the first place, I often find really mysterious. It just seems like that's the voice of the poem mm. and you've got to work with it. Yeah. It's, it's really rare, I think. To I mean, I don't know if you do this ever or occasionally to completely switch the sort of mode of a poem so so you try it in a kind of full-on narrative syntax mode and then I do do it occasionally then you think actually no what this needs is to be stripped right back and you you, you take it right back to kind of phrase it's not not that often but mm. do you do that sometimes yeah I mean all, all of my poems start off as 12 pages and then they end up three, <laughs> uh, three lines right. um but well, you, know, you were talking about the, the Sudley Field um, poem. Mm. And, um, and even though this book has a lot of travel in it, um, with Sudley Field, I mean, I might be wrong, but assuming it was by your house is kind of a, yeah. our, our classic lockdown routine, yeah. rewalking a place. And, you know, uh, New Brighton opens with the line, this place again, mm. uh, which you could kind of, you know, read in different ways the line almost uh, aggrieved or or yeah. um, or uh, insistent or, or, or yeah. so, you know the, something yeah. keeps on pulling pulling the poem mm. poet back to the to the place so there is an importance of of travel but also revisiting mm. um, and perhaps that also links in with with how the poem needs to be, because you you layer yeah. you know, a number of of times or visits into 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 a, a thing, uh, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the importance to you of of travel um, mm. for for the poems, because it's such a key theme in in this and in City of Departures as well. Mm. You know, all the the Denmark poems. Yeah. And stuff. Um, does yeah. it do you, do you write them you know do you see it as almost a form of travel writing in the poem or, or do these kind of condense afterwards and is there a difference between going to these places like Nova Scotia that mm. you know you haven't been to before mm. Mm. and revisiting uh, repeatedly one one place yeah that's really interesting um the revisiting thing I did get quite interested in. I had actually, I had actually walked around Sudley Field a lot before the lockdown. It's just my space for kind of walking around in a sort of meditative way. And I had an awful lot of um, notebook entries about it. I realized I was almost collecting these little fragmentary bits about the same place, but different times, you know, different seasons. Um, I mean, you know, obviously that's not a new idea. Lots of, lots of people have, have done that. Harriet Tarlow has a Super Bowl field where she just keeps revisiting the same the same field um but it does seem to offer a quite interesting because you're sort of going back to the same place all the time but it's different and you're different because mm -hmm. obviously you know you've changed in however smaller time you're, st you're still different you're never the same twice um so it <sighs> It actually just seems really interesting. It's sort of like you're putting pressure again on kind of one element to see what yeah. happens. And um, I do think that in um, 
but I think a colleague of mine from JMU who, who really knows about travel writing may be here and I've heard her talk about this quite new concept of um, vertical travel which is partly to do with lockdowns and people not being able to go to different places but that sense of exploring what's right in front of you but really finding ways to kind of dig down into it that is really interesting I think um, and, and, and also I have to say that sense of this place again why why this place again why is what is it about this place you know that keeps that keeps sort of dragging me back I think that's exactly what it is yeah yeah it's, it's almost like um you know if, if a poetic form gives restriction and freedom to yeah to, to the poem then maybe you know Sudley Field gives yeah. gives a similar thing to to you and the way it makes you have to yeah exactly and, and, and it forces you to really learn what you're mm. looking at actually mm. because I'm not a kind of um certainly not a kind of nature poet or nature writer in the sense that very often I don't know what I'm looking at you know I'm looking at a bird or a plant or a tree or something I don't know what it is um so so it almost pushes you to find ways and you know obviously you're you know you're absolutely brilliant at doing this to kind of zoom in on trying to think about how can I describe this or what, what is what is the question that this place seems to me to be asking me right here right now you know that, that it, it does it, it acts as a kind of constraint which is which is quite interesting and I suppose it is a quite an interesting contrast the idea of going to other places mm. which is a far more obvious mode isn't it to sort of go somewhere different and write about it and yet how often do you end up writing about exactly the same things or you know again what you're always doing is just bringing that kind of set of memories with you you can only really read something through your own set of experiences I think or, or, or you know so so you, you're sort of always taking taking that past or the places that you know anyway mm. with you um yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, no, no, well, it does. It does. Um, well, it's fascinating. I, I mean, I wish I could talk for forever, but I, I think we, we might have to um, uh, yeah. to go. So um, I guess it just it just remains to say uh, thank you very much and, and congratulations. Uh, it's a really, really uh, gorgeous uh, book. Um, as you. Becky said, there is a link at the, the top here um, where you can um buy a discounted copy is that right uh and with the with the um yeah. code there um so if everyone could could join me in, in saying congratulations to to helen helen I, everyone is saying it in the chat but, oh uh, thank you before. thank you um, thank you so much i, I right. really 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 am grateful thank you and and um, yeah it, it's lovely lovely to see all the messages in the chat so Hopefully we can remember to copy them out and save them because I always Yeah, I was just gonna say I'll do that for you, don't worry. <laughs> that'd be that'd be lovely. Thank yeah. you. Oh well, no, thank you both so much. It's been such a lovely evening. I really didn't want it to end at all. Um, I'm a bit gutted to be honest. And oh. yeah, but no, it was wonderful. Like your conversations were great. Um, your reading, Helen, was wonderful. And yeah, I'm going to leave the chat box open for a couple of minutes, um, so everyone can get their messages in, and then I'll send you a transcript of that as well. But no, thank you all. Thank you both so much. It's been thanks so really much, thank you. And, and thank yeah, you congratulations. So much, <laughs> thanks, everybody.